Guys, she's an American actress, comedian, and just a downright beautiful human being. She is best known for her work as an original cast member of the Nickelodeon sketch comedy series, All That, Figure It Out, The Steve Harvey Show, Dodgeball, and more. Ladies and gentlemen, I give to you the one and only Lori Beth Denberg. Lori, thank you so much for being a guest on the show today. Why, thank you so much for having me. Now... Lori Beth and I actually recorded a podcast a few weeks ago and yeah we we had a great there's now a lost episode of the Chris Canote show um and we had a great time talk we talked for like two and a half hours there were dogs that came in and out there was a lot going on we talked a lot about quarantine but since then so much has gone on with the peaceful protests and the violence that's come from that and this entire this entire upheaval that's going on that I just was like Chris it doesn't seem right to just put this out like nothing's going on and nothing not nothing nothing was going on but this wasn't happening when we recorded that so it just immediately felt outdated and weird to put on this big conversation of us just being like, hey, and then I did this when I was a kid, and then I got this dumped on my head. Right. And not acknowledge, it's like I was saying, I was watching um, Watch Jeopardy with my dad. He watched Jeopardy every night for like 29 million years. And we'd watch at the beginning of the quarantine. And it was so strange. I know from, I did the uh, game show Figure It Out on Nickelodeon. So I know that you film, you know, 35 episodes in two weeks. You shoot two, three, four a day. So we're the, there was this bank up of them and we're watching Jeopardy every day during quarantine. And it was so weird to just see Alex talk to the contestants and no one was saying anything. And there was a studio audience. And it was like this surreal thing where it's not meshing up with life. Um, And that's kind of how I felt about our first interview, which was like super fun. Hopefully the whole thing will get released one day. We will. We'll release it one day. My friend's dogs. Yeah. But yeah, to, um, you know, it just didn't feel right tonally to just put something out now that's so conversational because you and I are best friends now. Yes. Um, That's so sweet. (laughs) Just for everyone, everyone watching and listening after our first uh, interview, Chris wrote on his Facebook something like, when you do an interview with someone and accidentally become best friends, because I, I just had such a great time talking with you. I did too, Louis Beth, and that means the world to me. And you're just, you're just an awesome person. And I did feel that connection, truly. I wasn't just saying that. <laughs> and we are totally getting bulgogi next time I'm out there, for real. Yes. Yes. I did not forget that. So I, and, I have not forgotten it either. And you're going to come to Branson and we're going to go see Yakov Smirnoff together. I want to see everything in Branson. It is like my dream. And the fact that now I have like such a solid, you know, touchstone in you, we're going everywhere. Yeah. And I made sure one more time they didn't see this, but I'm wearing the Danny and Mike. <gasps> Danny and t-shirt. Mike. My, my little bubs. They're so awesome. I love those guys. I, I do know. too. Well, that's one of the things that, you know, a lot of people obviously with COVID and quarantine are out of work. I'm one of them. Um, and, but that's a lot of the stuff I was doing before the lockdown and shelter in place was um, doing stuff with Danny. And so that was just so much fun. So I'm hoping we get through this and that I get to go back and and smush him on his little face and give him shit until he cries. And then people laugh and clap at that. For everyone who doesn't know, tell everyone about the Danny and Mike podcast and how you're connected to that. Oh, okay. So Danny Tamborelli and Michael Morona, Michael C. Morona, were uh, the stars of The Adventures of Pete and Pete on Nickelodeon, which kind of was around my time at Nickelodeon and it's my favorite show. So funny, so ahead of its time. And so the first time I met Danny and Mike, I was like, so starstruck. I was like, I can, I'm Lori Beth. And um, so they 
started a few years ago, at least, a podcast called The Adventures of Danny and Mike. And it's really fun. It's the two of them and Jeremy Balin, their cohort producer extraordinaire. Great. Um, like shooting the shit and talking about stuff. And, you know, there's been this evolution because since they started the podcast, Danny's gotten married. Mike's had a kid. Danny's now had a kid who's almost a year old. So they would also do um, these Pete and Pete shows called, I think they're nostalgia personified Pete and Pete. And they'd go tour and they'd meet fans and stuff. And then Danny and I had done a project together called the Tonopah Five, link in the comments or whatever. And um, we just had such a great time together that he got the idea to do a nostalgia personified tour with me and all that tour so that's the stuff that we were doing i think we've done three runs on eastern seaboard and then in los angeles and then in florida and they're just like joyful me and danny and jeremy driving in a van you know just having fun and it's it's just really really fun and the fans that come out are so excited they're so excited and it's just lots of hugs. This has been the worst thing about quarantine. I know there are a lot worse things about everything, but I think, like I used to do drugs, I think my hug withdrawal is worse than my drug withdrawal. Like I am just so wanting to, I'm a very huggy person. I hug people when I see them, I hug tons of strangers. I get that question from a lot of fans, like they're like, I really loved you. And then it's like this, can I have a hug? And I'm like, yes, you can. That's awesome. So I didn't, I didn't know, and I bet a lot of people don't know that you had a, a past drug problem. Do you want to talk about that for a second and where you're at today with that? Sure. I, um, yeah, they're like all good child actors. I had a long and rocky road. No, actually, I didn't. It's funny. I didn't start doing any drugs at all until after. I was done with Nickelodeon. Um, I started late in the game. I don't have any of those good stories about being drunk at eight years old and, you know, coked up at my first audition or something. Um, but yeah, no, I just started smoking weed and then did nothing but smoke weed. And then I would, you know, when cocaine was around, I do cocaine. I was never good at drinking, but I could not function if I wasn't high if I didn't have pot and eventually that kind of as you might imagine bottomed out my life and you know I got some help I've been sober for almost 15 years good for you yeah and I try to help other people that are struggling and it's just you know I, w I worked for a year because acting for anyone who's wondering acting is not a full-time job usually <laughs> It's a very freelance job. And so there's always stuff that, you know, people try to do in the interim to make ends meet. So I've been a dog walker and a pet sitter and a copywriter. And I worked for a year at a drug and alcohol detox where I was kind of like a little mini nurse and we would take care of people that were kicking heroin, that were kicking alcohol, like serious, um, serious withdrawals and you know with pot you don't have that kind of serious physical withdrawal it you, you people do have symptoms of withdrawal so a lot of people but, don't think yeah. because marijuana is natural i think there's a lot of people that have this misconception that it's not addictive but like joe rogan he's a wake and baker or used to be and he when he quit like and took breaks or whatever. I don't know where he has is, is today on that, but he said it's hard. It is addictive. It is addictive. Yeah. And, and it comes down to, I think to the addictive personality as well. Do you think, would you say you have addictive oh. personality? Yeah, I might. I might just a little bit. It's like I said, um, what I say is like, I'm addicted to checking out. I mean, long before I picked up any drug or drink, I was, obsessed with television food is an issue for me if if america doesn't know that by now and 
but I'm addicted to just checking out and not having to deal with how I feel, what I need to do, what I'm afraid of. And in the end, pot was the thing that let me do that most effectively. Because I was never good at drinking. I would just throw up and feel awful. It's like, I'm trying to not feel awful. So that didn't work. You know, cocaine just, I always say I did special occasion cocaine and the special occasion was that it was in front of me, you know, but it's not, nothing I ever had to seek out and like had to get my, get my guy on the phone. But weed was just 24 seven. If I didn't have any, there was nothing I was going to do until I got some. And that just led me to not work, to not go out to not do anything to completely isolate and eventually say, well, I can't really blame anything else at this point for me being completely unemployed, unemployable, broke, you know, all this stuff that comes with ignoring your entire life. So I'm doing better now. There are still, there are still issues because I'm still that addictive personality and I still don't want to deal with things just because I'm not actively, you know, smoking my brains out so that I, so that I don't like, I'm still like, I don't want to deal with that. So hello, Candy Crush, you know, hello, Candy Crush and watching Rick and Morty over and over on my bed instead of dealing with the giant pile of papers. But we all have our, our vices. Wouldn't you say that's true? Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I, and it's, it's, And it's across the board. It's this thing where, you know, you always think the grass is greener. You know, there's people that are addicted to exercise, exercise bulimics. You go, oh, I wish that was my thing. It's like, no, you don't. I have a friend who is. She's blown out her knees. She missed a flight. She had to go running. So she missed a flight and she lost her job because of it. You know, there's no, people are fucked up, man. And if people tell you they don't have a vice or an issue, I think they're lying to you because I think we, to some degree, all have one of those demons, at least one. Yeah. It could be something that's, hold on, I feel like I'm going to cough a lot. That's not good for a show. I can cut them all out. That's the beauty of this. I know. But don't cut this out because what I've realized from being on Zoom meetings and being bored is when I have my water bottle and I do this, it looks like I have an evil goatee. It does. Hmm. Like I'm full on Alan Rickman in Die Hard right now. Get that cowboy. <laughs> but instead, it's just me drinking out of my Sephiris. Nice. My Sephiris bottle full of crystal light. That's awesome. Okay, anyway. How did you get into acting? Were you a child actor at a very young age or did you start later or how did that start? I loved plays, doing plays, drama, choir and stuff since maybe preschool. I know a very specific moment in time was when I was in first grade, my first grade and second, it was a split class. So she was my first and second grade teacher, Miss Valerie Plaisance. Hello. She's my Facebook friend and she's awesome. Uh, she did a lot of plays and I just took to it. I learned everybody's lines. I was like focused on it. And I just really, really was enthralled by the whole process by me. I think part of it is having what you're going to say and knowing what's going to happen. There's kind of a safety in that. Um, And so we just did a bunch of plays that year and then there was school chorus. And then I would do, you know, at summer camp, it's like when you get to choose, are you going to go to soccer for your free period? Are you going to go to, sign language i was like i'm gonna go to drama always go to drama i think i did go to a summer camp where sign language was a thing and that was cool but i chose to go to drama and that's just how it was through junior high through high school i was not a good student um because i just didn't care i didn't go to school a lot i didn't have a great childhood and i kind of was like it's quiet at my house 
And, but I was very involved in the drama departments and that's where I put all of my focus, like all of it. And it was a drama competition in Southern California. It's the DTASC Festival. Dra oh, let's see, acronym. Drama Teachers Association of Southern California. Um, and they had two festivals a year, a fall festival and then a Shakespeare festival, which was, I don't know, in spring, fall, winter, or Shakespeare. It was sometime other than fall. And I was in a scene in my senior year. And what it is is a cutting of five minutes from a play and all different categories, group humorous, group comedy, monologue, two-person serious, and two-person comedy was the one that I was in. And we did a cutting of the Kathy and Mo show, which uh, was Mo, not Mo Collins. Mo Collins is the actress that was on Parks and Rec. Mo Gaffney. Mo Gaffney and Kathy Najimi used to be um, like partners. And they would do sketch comedy and they did plays. And so we did a cutting, me and this other girl, from a sketch called Las Hermanas, like the sisters. And I can't necessarily remember exactly what it was about, but we did a five minute cutting of that. The rules of the drama festival are, you know, no props, no costumes, everything you wear has to be something you would wear to school. And uh, then you get to use two folding chairs. So that was our deal. And our scene won first place. And then there was a showcase of all the first place scenes in all the categories at Paramount Studios in this small little theater. And we have been told, you know, there'll probably be people there with giving you their business card, like, hey, I wanna be your agent, or do you need headshots? And they were like, just don't worry about them. And so we were there and the next day we got a call to the drama room that had its own phone. That's how high flying we were. Um, saying they wanted me and the other girl in the scene with me to come audition for untitled sketch comedy program for Nickelodeon. So it was like, okay, whatever. And so I went completely on a lark, like wasn't, I wasn't like, this is my big break. How am I going to fly now? And I just went, I had the material, I did the material and they liked me. And I think part of it was that I wasn't going in with any expectations or any, you know, I wasn't nervous about it because I thought it was a, a joke or at least a lark, you know? And they liked me, they called me back for a call back. And then they called me and told me that I got the job and they wanted me to come to Orlando to do the pilot. And that is it, it was my first professional audition. And there you have it. But I always knew I wanted to be an actor and there was nothing else that I was prepared for. There was absolutely nothing else that I'd put one iota as much um, focus and work into as anything drama related in my life. So I just didn't know how that was going to happen. And that's how it happened. Did you have any idea how big all that was going to be when you got this role? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's not, it's because people will ask me that, like, did you think 25 years ago that God's probably 30 years now, that you would still be blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, you don't think that at the time. I remember this one, this one memory is very strong. We were doing, I, I don't know if we were in the first season or whatever, but Josh Server got this like really contemplative look on his face. And he was like, I just got this feeling that we're gonna be here for a long time. It was like, what are you possessed by some weird thing right now? But he just had this feeling. And the pilot, the pilot was the pilot. Um, but when he got into the first season, it was fun and it was good. And it was smart and it was funny and weird and subversive, but not yucky. And certainly not condescending to kids like, hey, kids, it's time for the show. 
you know, there was nothing like that. And so we thought it was good. It wasn't a surprise to be picked up, but there was no thing, nothing at the time that was like, this is a seminal moment in 90s television for an entire generation of people, you know? And the fact that it is, because I'd always had that thought, like, just think of any, any, like, what's one of your favorite movies? Oh, gosh. The Goonies. Okay. So you're making The Goonies, and it's such a moment of t- in time, and you go, wow, how awesome for those actors, that group of people, that they got to be part of that, you know? And, or I think of something like Freaks and Geeks the TV show. It's like, that was something to be a part of. And now it turns out I am part of something like that because all that has emerged or not emerged, but like consistently been this touchstone for a lot of people. So it's, it's very cool and it's very satisfying. I always say I'm really lucky that I wasn't, I didn't play the villain on some sitcom so everybody would be like, oh, are you Lori Beth Denberg? I hate you. And I'd have to be like, okay, that means I did a good job. But so to be, to be recognized and to be appreciated by fans for something that I'm proud of is so satisfying, so gratifying. And uh, so... <laughs> So you mentioned playing the villain. And when I was in New York City, um, I'm currently working on a documentary. COVID kind of messed that up uh, on child actors. And I had the Uh opportunity to hang out with Devin Rattray, who played Buzz on Home Alone. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's he's also been in a lot of great movies. But um, one thing we were talking about was the whole Buzz thing. And he says, you know, I'm grateful for that role. Don't get me wrong. It's awesome. And he said, but one thing that there's like a trigger when people either introduce him or come up to him and say, buzz, buzz. He said, there is like this trigger or something where he's like, and I think a lot of like fans and stuff don't quite understand that. Do you have anything like that because Buzz was kind of the mean the mean brother to Kevin. Yeah. So it's like being known for that kind of has its, you know, negative but but do you have do you have any triggers like that? I don't. I mean, I get I get called Lydia by a lot of people cuz Lydia was the name of my character on the Steve Harvey show. But even that that's not, you know, my character was cool. My character had a lovely arc that went from super lame to super awesome. And I don't, I'm lucky. I'm lucky that I don't have that going on. What about when people come up to you and go, can you give us a vital information? Does that make you kind of go uh, like, like that? You just yeah. did it. You just did the face. Of course you yeah. can't do that in public, but inside, are you kind of doing that sometimes? Oh yeah. I usually say, you tell me one. Like, it is my job to not go around saying vital information for people. And Danny took over vital information for me when I left uh, all that. And so we still get asked that constantly. And so we uh, we have a little, you know, routine that we do, our little tradition that if one of us is asked by by the staff, by the press or whatever. So can you give us one of your favorite vital informations? Like the other one will do something crazy or, you know, I'll just say, um, you know, why don't you tell me one? Or we started giving out just grown up vital information. Like if you're going to rent an apartment, get the renter's insurance. It's worth it. Because there's something you don't want to be, you know, a wind up, monkey where people say you know do this for me I love it and then you also I never wanted to kind of trade on that probably to my detriment because uh, you know a hundred thousand times I've gotten some offer to be like we want you to do this video you could do like a vital information thing 
And I'm like, I don't, I don't want to do that. I'm sorry. And I did it one time for, uh, what's his name? Perez Hilton. We did a celebrity, it was called viral information. I was very proud of myself when I came up with that. And it was very, it was adult and it was about celebrities and it wasn't, a, you know, it was a parody of vital information on many levels, but it's that kind of yuckiness of not wanting, you know, I can't imagine that Daniel Craig goes around going, Bond, James Bond, you know? <laughs> and it's not, it's not at all like, well, I'm a serious actress and I don't do that. You know, it's like nothing like that. It's just, I'm not outperforming. And I also like to involve the other people. I learned early on when I started to get recognized, which is really weird, to I, that I had to just engage the other person as a other person with their life going on because otherwise there's not much to talk about, you know? So I'll say, why don't you tell me one? But it is interesting, like the least, the least favorite thing is, and I don't know what people are thinking, but you know, if I'm in line somewhere, you, you can kind of tell, I'm sure you can too, and like someone's looking at you and they go like, is that, do you think that's that girl? You know, and then sometimes people will just kind of start singing the all that theme song, which is like, like I'm gonna be like, that's the song that's on the show that I was on the show of, you know? And so it's, yeah, you know, weird. if it, it, it's, it's kind of weird. And then there was this girly chick who I was at a frozen yogurt place and she was so excited. She was with her husband, fiance, boyfriend, whatever. But she like came up to me and you could tell that she'd been like practicing it for a minute. She goes, you're Lori Beth Denberg with vital information for my everyday life. And I was like, I am, I ain't, you know, and, but it was like, she had this, this prepared thing that she thought maybe that she thought I needed, like she needed to, to, to prove to me how, how important what I did was that that was the only way she could get my time and when meanwhile, I was like, oh, hi, bunny, what are you doing? You know, like if she had just said hello or whatever, but she was so excited. And I'm certainly never, I can't think of a time when I didn't, wasn't happy to speak to someone. There's one time I was in Florida because the Steve Harvey, <laughs> it was one of those things. Steve Harvey show was a, a high school thing. And Steve Harvey was the teacher. There were teachers and the coach and the principal and then the kids. And it was like, Mr. Hightower, we want a trip to Orlando, Florida, Universal Islands of Adventure, or whatever it's called. And it was like, well, what did we do for that? It's like, it doesn't matter. Just we're going. We're just going. And um, I remember one guy coming up to me. There's a couple people and this guy. And then he started to like try to take barrettes out of him. I was in... I was in wardrobe and character and everything because we were shooting. Not to say I was in character, but I was in wardrobe, my hair and makeup were done. And he started trying to like pull shit out of my hair. And I was just like, excuse me. It was really weird. But that I think is the only time that I felt, you know, any like, ugh. Other than that, it's like I said, I have people coming up to me and saying how somewhere along the line, every 90s kid got together and decided they were going to use the phrase, you made my childhood. They say, you made my childhood. And it's like, how great is that? You know? Honestly, you, you were a huge part of my childhood and you helped me get through oh. some of the most awkward adolescent times going through puberty, middle school. Yeah. I mean, it was some of the most awkward times of all of our lives. And it helped me just take my mind and escape from all the bullshit. You know what I mean? I'm and, glad. And it's just, it's, it's fantastic. It was an SNL for kids. It was amazing. Yeah. And I get, I get plenty of correspondence from people saying I was fat as a kid and seeing you on TV made me feel like I could be funny or 
just, you know, seeing how funny you were made me want to be a comedian or I was gay and I got bullied a lot. But when I watched you, everything was okay. So that's been a constant throughout the last 30 years, which is like pretty fucking awesome. You know, and, I, and here I'm getting that for doing what I love, which is to go onto a set and do my thing. So, you know, there's nothing better than that. You are considered nostalgic. Is that cool yes. to you or is that weird to you? It is weird. I think it inherently means I'm old. Um, I, it's very strange. It is really, really strange. It's built into that concept I said of that I was part of this moment in time you know, and that moment in time just persists. So it's very interesting. It's a very interesting phenomenon to be, to have been part of people's childhoods. Because I know TV was amazingly important, important to me growing up. I was focused. I almost studied it. You know, that was a big part of me knowing I wanted to be an actor. So to have been a positive part of someone else's lives in that way is I can really relate to it from both sides now. So it's a very, it is very weird, but it's very, it's very good. There's not a downside to it. Real, well, so far. <laughs> Absolutely. Speaking of childhood and I'm sure every generation can say this, but I truly believe that the nineties were some of the last best times of earth's existence. <laughs> Do you think that's weird for me to say that? No, I think merely from a kid's TV perspective, I feel like the tail end of like all that and Keenan and Kel, like a lot of stuff that came afterwards got really hypersexualized, like hot little Disney girls and hot Nickelodeon girls looking like they were 18 and dressed like they were 18 and going to the club with, you know, when they were 12 and like, what am I going to do for my school project, you know, in the script. So I think that that really did take a turn downward. You know, you look at, at Clarissa and she's, She's just being Clarissa and the TV shows for kids started to reflect all the bullshit of society, which is, I guess is, you know, what happens. It's a reflection, a reflect, you know, and then it's that thing of like television's a reflection of society and then society reflects television and, but in that sense, you have control over what you want to do and make. So it just seems like it did get a, like sexier and, and that made it yeah. yuckier. The 2000s brought Britney, Christina, all that kind of stuff. And you did see yeah. huge, like Britney was like the, her video. I remember when her video was released, they released it MTV, like at this special time, like either 10 o'clock at night. On, and I remember like, it was like on everyone's calendar because it was supposed to be mm -hmm. so like, you know, pushing the boundaries and like overly sexualized and all this stuff like school yeah. girl, all this stuff. But what I mean by the nineties being one of the last best times of earth's existence, I know that sounds kind of crazy, but everything has become so advanced so advanced like back then oh back yeah, then I, I mean i mean yeah television too and like but like you and i and i don't know well i don't know about you but like i would still ride my bike and my parents wouldn't have to worry if i didn't if i if i was home by dinner they didn't have to worry or, yeah. or until the sun was down so that kind of stuff and if we had to get on the internet like it, it was 56k it was just fast enough to get on for what you needed and then you got off and you didn't spend the whole yeah. day on it and i feel like I feel like we're too connected I, that's kind of what i feel about that when i when i say that yeah no i totally got it as soon as you were talking about it it is 
you know, and it's that conundrum, not to sound deep, because obviously I'm the 90 millionth person to say this, but we're so connected that we're less connected. Now, you and Danny spent a lot of time together. Um, did you have to audition for Figure It Out, or were you just kind of like brought into that because, you know, it was just a game show and like, we want you? Yeah, he and I were just brought into it. I was brought in as kind of the mainstay. Um, like I was the anchor of the panel and then Danny ended up doing so many of them. It was like, kind of like the two of us. That's where we really fell in love. That's where I think we really got into our big sister, little brother roles. Cause he's the oldest. He has two little sisters. So he never had a big sister to give him shit. And so I was glad to be of service. Um, and yeah, so we've always just had a lot of fun. We've always had a lot of fun together and figure it out was so crazy. We just did the craziest shit on that show. And was it really all like legit? Like you had no idea. And if, and if you guessed it within the first five minutes, it's like, okay, come on out. Or did they kind of, yeah, we had no idea. There are a lot, everyone stop this podcast and go watch the movie quiz show. Um, there are serious laws in place governing game shows. And they were absolutely followed to a T. We were, the, the panel were sequestered. We didn't see anything that went on. It was all very legitimate. And except for, well, there's one instance, but um, except for like washing our hair and stuff afterwards, we were in separate trailers. And there was one instance where we guessed it too quickly and they said, you know, if you know it, just play it out a little bit because you can still guess it, but if you guess it in the first round, we don't have a show to show, you know, and we don't get to drop all the stuff on you and have all the clues. So we learned to, and that didn't happen so often. And we really had to figure it out, but um, there was only one time when I accidentally got some information because there's one show where half of the show I hosted and Summer Sanders was on the panel, like we swooshed. And when I was inside getting mic'd up, the audio guy said, hey, did you see that elephant outside? And I said, no. And so I had a feeling that the part of the show that I was the panelist for had something to do with an elephant. So when we were shooting that and they dropped peanuts on me, I didn't guess elephant. I just didn't guess. I just let it go. Good because for you. That's, Good for that's you. stupid. And I think the kid won. I can't remember. All I know is I didn't guess it. Because You're like, that's... I'm not going to be the one to guess elephant because, yeah. Yeah. Like, it's the first thing I say before any clues. Does it have to do with an elephant? <laughs> People already already hated me enough for figuring it out. When I first started uh, Facebook, when Facebook was pretty new and I finally joined it, there was a group called Lori Beth Denberg Ruined My Life, which I took great pride in. But it was based on how I would um, figure it out to crush children's dreams of getting their favorite vacation which was not the, not the thing. And the first time I ever did figure it out, I felt so awful. Like I figured it was this kid who burped Christmas carols and I had like guessed it and figured it out. And you know, the answer board goes bling. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so excited. And then I look over at the kid and he's like, oh, and I realized, oh no, I figured it out. And now he doesn't win. Like it hadn't occurred. It had never happened before. And I felt so awful. And I talked to one of the producers, Kevin Kay, and I was like, that's just terrible. And he said, well, you're here to figure it out. And then I was like, it's on. And I forgot, did, uh, did these kids get a prize if you couldn't figure it out? Was that how it worked? I forgot about that part. There were three rounds. The first round, they would get like some piece of garbage that was hanging around. Like they'd get pieces of old sets. Like here's a piece of the aggro crag from Guts. Or here's a piece of the all that stage. 
Um, and then other stuff like shoes or video games and stuff. So they get a small prize if they pass round one, a bigger medium sized prize. That was more like a video game console or something for round two. And the prize for round three was always a trip, a family trip to, you know, wherever. Smuggler's Notch, Vermont was one of our favorites because it's just like, what? Smuggler's Notch sounds so dirty. And then there'd be some kids, like, they already get a trip to come to the show, to come to Orlando. So if kids from Wisconsin and they get on the show, their whole family comes. And then sometimes the trip would be a trip to Orlando. And I just thought, that's, that's not a lot. But to a kid to come back and go to all the theme parks, I'm sure. Did they at least get to like to do the theme park for free and all that? Was that kind of part of bringing them into? They get to stay there and do it all. I would I, assume, or no? I, don't know. I hope so. I don't know because I didn't have anything to do with the with the contestants. We wouldn't see or meet them until they stepped on stage, and and that was it because we were totally out of the loop about who they are, what they did. So I hope they did. When that sign, I remember when you just made me remember that sign was awesome when you flip over the answers. Billy was, the answer head. Was that, was there someone behind there doing that or was it all electronic? I don't know. My guess is that there was someone behind there going, floop. <laughs> I don't know why. It's it a random question. Yeah. I was like, Whoa. no, I, you're asking me things I've never thought about. And what's funny is I'm sure there was someone back there and I'm sure they were a great friend of mine. Because I've been working with the same crew members, you know, on and off for, you know, five years at that point, doing all that and then figure it out. So, yeah, there was a, probably somebody going like, okay, flip number two. Man, what a stressful job. Could you imagine flipping the wrong one? Oh, a, a wrong one did get flipped once. A wrong one did get flipped once and it said watermelon and the kid had eaten 12 pounds of watermelon he won a contest but they phrased it in specifically how much and i remember that it flipped over and so then none of us i, I think they literally dropped watermelon on us so at some point you kind of had to but i remember not trying that hard at that but that only happened one time as well lori beth how did you feel when you learned that they were bringing back all that again, the new generation? I thought it was smart and I thought there's definitely a place for it and that it could be, you know, great. And I thought, cause people, when they brought it back, people were like, oh, I'm so excited. Your show is coming back. And I was like, I'm not going to be on it, you know? <laughs> and I did think that, you know, we would come in and like pass the torch or something. Um, and that would be really, really cool. And um, they ended up having us, I got the, the script for the first week of with the new cast. P.S. and by the way, the new cast are so awesome, so funny, so smart. I love seeing them. That's been awful being away from them because I just, the last time I went, I wasn't even working. I just went to go visit and, you know, just got all the hugs and they're so good. And it's really gratifying to be there with them on their first week to help them along a little bit. Like there's all that, you know, when you're on a set, there's all this lingo, you know, back to one upstate, like whatever it is. And you could see, you know, all the old hats, professional adults were like, okay. And some of the kids would be like, uh, and I was able to say back to one means we go to our very first positions, you know, stuff like that, that I know because that was me, you know, I had to learn all that stuff as well. And doing sketch comedy is, it's like doing 10 sitcoms a week. So it's a real like crash course in TV production, which was awesome. But when you're a kid, and all these kids were like 11, 12, or 13. I was 18 when I started. So that's a big gap in cognizance and in confidence. So I was really able to kind of watch the kids and say, you know, oh, this is the, you know, or, oh, you ask that question. That's a really good question. Because there's a tendency to be like, I'm supposed to know all this. 
and I'm a kid and I'm going to look stupid if I don't know it. And it's like, no, that's not the deal. But I did, I got the script because they had said, oh, come, you know, well, you'll be in the first episode. And I figured we'd be in the cold open and be like, hey, I'm sick of doing this show. I sure wish there were new kids that could do it. And um, there was not that, but not that brilliant piece of writing, but, you know, something like that. But then I'm opening the script and reading the table of contents and it says, vital information, Lori Beth Denberg. Out librarian, Lori Beth Denver, which, and I was like, what? I didn't quite understand it. Um, especially the vital information thing. I was like, are they serious? But it ended up being this wonderful thing where I smushed the torch to Reese Cadell, who is just such a silly little muffin. So that was really, really fun. And then she took it over. And then I just did over the course of the first, I don't know, couple stints of episodes that they had, did a few loud librarians. We did um, an island girls where we passed the torch to two other boys and now they're the island boys, they're stuck on the island. So there's stuff like that. But I certainly did not expect to open the script and see vital information with Lori Beth Dunberg and the loud librarian. So that was, um, that was fun. It was weird. It was weird that it wasn't weird. People are saying, is it weird to be back? And I just walked onto the set to rehearse and I'm, you know, just the sense like muscle memory. I said to the prop people, I go, I need an apple box down here behind the desk because I put my props on it. Like it would just, it felt like no time had passed. It was weird that it wasn't weird. You felt at home. I felt... It wasn't so much that I felt at home as it's like, okay, I know how to do this. There was no, you get on other sets and you have to meet the people and you, you know, you don't know what you're doing yet. It's all new, but this was like not new. So, and except for now the lad librarian has new kids to yell at and, you know, threaten with bodily harm. So that's fun. Are you still close to any of the original cast members of all that? I would say by far I'm closest with Danny by far, but we see each other. We love Danny, you, Danny. and Mike. Dude, I have to say Danny um, and Mike, obviously, but Danny, I got the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a statement that says so much. Danny, and of course Mike, but Danny. Yeah. <laughs> no, Mike really is awesome too. But but I had the opportunity mm-hmm. to hang out with uh, with Danny and, and um, in, in New York City working on a documentary. And I got to hang out with him and his beautiful family. And I just got to say, like, I love that dude. And he took me yeah. out for some awesome street tacos. And then he took me and Aaron to this killer bar called, was it called Skinny Dennis? And it was like this hole in the wall kind of bar in Brooklyn but yet it yep. wasn't it was like really cool but a shoulder to shoulder it was Christmas like they had lights hanging up it felt like you were just like it was just perfect and like man yeah. I'll never forget that Danny and guys here's a little drop for Danny and Mike check out their podcast it is wonderful so check that out it I'll put is. a link in the description so but um, oh can I be can I blatantly plug myself then oh please because listen to this Jeremy Balin, who is Danny and Mike's producer and kind of the third guy, he's on every sitcom. He kind of moderates or tries to bring it, you know, tries to herd the cats. So he and I are working on a podcast um, that we think is going to be called Bad Advice with Lori Beth Denver, where people will write in and ask me questions. And um, my oldest friend in the world, Clark Crozer, will be my, you know, not sidekick, but he will be on the podcast with me and he'll curate the questions and, and ask them of me on the air so I won't have seen them. And so we're working right now on setting that up. And I think that could be really, really fun. That is so exciting. I'm so like uh, ready for yeah. that. When right? do you think that's going to drop? I don't, we are literally, like, he is literally shipping me a microphone right now. We are so not in that stage. It is, our our, our podcast is a zygote. 
and it will continue to blossom in my vagina. But um, uh, it'll be really echoey. All the sound will be really echoey because it's happening in my vagina. But uh, yeah, no, I've talked for a long time about uh, doing a podcast with my friend Clark and who's a writer and has, we've been writing partners on lots of projects and just couldn't, we came, it's like, well, what is the podcast? You know, what is it? And it's like, well, it's just you talking. I'm like, that's not enough for, to be an it. So we came up with this and there are other, uh, you know, advice podcasts and stuff. So it's not like, oh, we're breaking new ground, but I just think that I, um, could have fun with it and that I could actually just you know maybe even help someone but also just be funny and goofy and whatever so that's my shameless plug oh it's not shameless at all I am so grateful and thankful that you told me that because like that's gonna be awesome so when that's up send me a link so. so I can like blast that out too hell yeah yeah um Tell me, Lori Beth, what is one thing that most people don't know about you? Hmm. I would say probably that I had a drug problem. I mean, I put it on Facebook. I have I have thousands, probably literally, of fans that are my Facebook friends. Just my regular Facebook friends that, you know, I don't know who they are, and I'm like, I don't care. And if someone's a problem, you can always, like, smush them away, but... And I put up every year, you know, on the date that I got sober, you know, Lori Beth Thunberg, I'm 12 years sober today. I'm 14 years, you know, whatever it is, because that's just it. And I've actually gotten response from a few people saying, that's so great. I didn't know you were sober too, or, you know, that kind of stuff. And one guy actually reached out to me and said, you know, I, I'm wondering if you could tell me a little more about that. And he felt that he had had a problem with pills and he wasn't sure. And the whole quarantine was kind of making him feel itchy. So I talked to him on the phone, you know, and, you know, got the layout. Cause I was like, Hey, I'm not going to just tell this guy, you know, I, like I said, I worked in a detox. So I'm not going to say this guy will just stop doing, you know, if he's really addicted to pills, that's a dangerous detox. Right. So I just wanted to get, I mean, we were like, you know, typing on messenger and I was like, no, can I, can you, can I call you? Because I don't want to tell you something that's dangerous, you know? Yeah. I've so had it's a like we of... connected. That's great. That's so awesome that, that you're an advocate for that and you're, and you're helping people. I've had a lot of people contact me too. Um, as I've went through something called benzodiazepine withdrawal a long oh, time ago. Oh, that's very difficult. Yeah. Because like that, o opiates, yeah. opiate withdrawal is physical as benzodiazepine is like mostly mental and it's just yeah. your central nervous system going and completely insane. It's awful. And you are in and out. And, you know, when I worked in the detox, those were the most, I don't mean to say they were the most difficult cases, but like the most difficult because they would wake up and say, where am I? Where are my keys? Where's my wallet? Where's my phone? And we'd have to talk them down. You know, one guy who was going through that just thought he was at work. He was like, well, I'm at work. And it's, you know, kind of like you're not supposed to feed into the delusion. But at some point it was like, he's fine when he's at work. When we tell him he's at detox is when he gets upset. So that is a rough run, a rough one. I do not envy you having gone through that, but it was crazy. congratulations on making it through. Thank you. And it took probably a good year to actually, because people think that even doctors, unfortunately, um, don't really believe it a whole lot. I think the younger doctors are obviously there's new information coming out. They're like, no, dude, it's totally real. But it, it's, it's, it's nonlinear healing. Like people think it just should, oh, you come off and slowly through time yeah. you're going to feel like this. But really it's like, I've learned about windows and how you're going to feel really good for a while. And then you're going to be bad. And then you're just going to be good for a little bit. And those windows, yeah. they get a little bit more longer. And then it, it slowly, you just, you're like, Oh my gosh, I think we did it. And so it was, it was a very trying time and not just for me, but for my family too. And my wife and, yeah. but I'm so glad to put that behind me, but I get people asking me a lot, 
hey man, I'm on I'm on Ativan, I'm on Xanax, and my doctors had me on it for a long time. I want off. It's actually making things worse. I'm going through tolerance withdrawal. How do I get off? And I'm like, first of all, I'm not a doctor. Yes. Here is my journey. Here's what I did. Go talk go talk to your doctor about this, you know, possible way of coming off safely. But I'm not a doctor. Like you gotta be real careful about that. Yeah. So I get that. Oh yeah. Is it true that you are an or ordained minister? Aha, uh -huh, it is true. Is it minister or ministress? Minister Minist or ministress? Um, <laughs> ministress sounds very dominatrix-ish. Doesn't it? I say an ordained minister, and I use the word officiant, like when I'm signing wedding um, licenses and stuff. But it's true. You really do. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, actually, my friend Clark, that I referenced as going to be in my podcast with me, um he is my oldest friend we were in a first second split grade class in in mrs place Sons's class where we did all those plays this whole thing is coming together um he and his now wife asked if i would get ordained to marry them it was like this they were having a very small wedding and i was over and i said you know i'm so happy to help you with anything, I'm not assuming I'll be invited. Cause I just knew they were having a small wedding, their venue. And they both looked at me like, what the fuck are you talking about? Of course you're invited. And I said, oh, I should get ordained and marry you. Then I'll definitely get invited. And it was like, ha ha ha. But apparently a few days later, she went up to him in the kitchen and was like, I know Lori was kidding. They call me Lori. They're grandfathered into calling me Lori. I know Lori was kidding, but I think she should marry us. And Clark said, I was thinking the same thing. So they asked me to, to be their officiant. So I got ordained in like two seconds on the internet. And I wrote them a you know, ceremony personalized for them. And people just really flipped their lids for it. They, at, people at the wedding were just like, that was the best wedding I've ever been to. And you should do this professionally. And I thought, well, this worked because I've known Clark for 30 years, 35 years, 40 years, you know? And so that kind of helped me write a ceremony for him, but they were like, you can figure it out. So figure it out. The, the, the term figure it out and all that come up all the time in regular conversation. And it's hard not to be like, so um, <laughs> I just decided to offer my services. Karen, Clark's wife, um, she had a wedding blog that turned into a, uh, not a website, you know, a website. <laughs> I'm so tech savvy. She had a wedding blog called No Wedding Debt. That's now noweddingdebt.com. And she gets all kinds of hits. It's stuff she put together when she was doing her wedding. And she talks about me on the site. So I would get people calling me from that site to ask about doing their weddings. And I just got into this, you know, rhythm with it where a new couple will call me and we'll meet in person or on Skype because I've gone to oh, like around the country doing them and I'll interview them for like two hours and ask them everything from, you know, where are you from? What do you do? And then when did you meet through like the honeymoon? And I'll just ask them a million questions and I'll write down all the answers. And I use that information to write their personalized wedding ceremony. And it's just really cool. It's one of my favorite things that I do. It's very special to be a part of that moment. And I didn't realize that till I was marrying Clark and Karen that when you're at a wedding, you're usually like looking at the back of the guy and, you know, trying to hear, but we were all three just getting married is the best seat in the house. That's what I say. Get, you know, being the efficient is the best seat in the house. So I've done that. I've probably done about 25. I have one coming up in September in Virginia. I'm hoping that that can go on because people have been you know, just like they've been not having graduations, they've been postponing weddings, all this kind of stuff with the COVID and quarantine and everything that we're dealing with. So hopefully this one in September, I love these people. Uh, we talked for hours on Skype and, you know, I just got to know them and I'm really hoping to be able to get 
to get there and hug them. I just want to hug someone. I know. I'm I very wish... excited. A friend's dog is coming over next weekend. Oh, fun. I'm just so excited. You love dogs, and I, I love oh, you for man. loving dogs. That's so awesome. I love dogs too much. Um, Speaking of coronavirus... Uh, mm -hmm. what do you, what do you think about it? Like as of now, I, I, there was an article last night that came out and it just had me just scratching my head and I'm so exhausted from it too. And I'm just like, I, I don't even know what to believe anymore because now, and I don't know who's doing it. It, it was saying that all this information and, and, and data that's coming in from all these nursing homes are like so skewed now, like one nursing home, you know, the CDC or whoever put out said it had like 530 cases and they're like, uh, we, we've had like 20 cases or hmm. 50 or a hundred. And then like all this stuff. And I'm like going, Oh my gosh. And like, what do you, what do you believe? Like, I know it's bad. Obviously I've, I've it's, but that stuff like that just makes me so angry. It's like 2020. I'm like, can we not count? Can we not punch in into a computer? Like how many, like, where's this getting skewed from like point A to point B? Like, I don't know. Like, how do you feel about it any anymore? I feel exactly like you do. Like, I don't know what's true. I don't know what's true. And knowing that I feel like I'll err on the side of caution and wear my mask, like a respectful, decent human being. Speaking of masks, by the way, today there was a report that came out masks. We can put this argument to the side. Now masks, they've done some big studies are proven to protect you up to 79% uh, from getting the coronavirus. That's huge. That's yeah, really yeah. Huge. It's, it is difficult to believe. And Facebook, I was just on Facebook actually before I was here with you. And I think we talked the other night too. And it was just like, you get drawn into it, just watch videos. It's, it, and it's all very skewed. You do, I don't know what to believe. I have to believe most of it is false. And I, I really tend to click on stories from what I know to be reputable sources, you know, Washington Post, CNN. Sometimes I click on Fox News just for a good laugh and yeah. then to be outraged. But, um, you know, the rest of it is just so yeah. undeniably dangerous. Yeah, and I'm not I'm not trying to say it's a conspiracy at all or nothing like that. I, I just think what it, it just kind of shows where our country's at when it comes to dealing with a, a pandemic like we are. Like we were not prepared. Yeah. We obviously like can't get data and it's not fair. It's not fair for us because I don't know how to plan now. I don't I don't know when I read an article like that that just comes out going Studies are, or not studies, uh, you know, these numbers are all apparently messed up. Some are, you know, under, some are overshot. And it's like, yeah. I'm like, what do you believe? And I know I would, this, I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know either. And that's been my main constant over the last few weeks is I don't know what to believe. Yeah, and this is actually new to me as well. Like, because I think you and I were both on the same page the, the first time we were talking about, I'm like, dude, wear a mask. Like, I'm washing my hands, social distancing. It's important. Yeah. The people who don't believe that I think are crazy. Here's the numbers. And then just like the past week or two, I'm like, I, what? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Well, we are dealing with leadership who deals in alternative facts. So that's what, that's what lies are, is alternative facts. And when you start from such a low, pathetic place, who do you believe? And there's the few, you know, the touchstones. I'll say, hey, Dr. Fauci, I think I will listen to you. Can you please come be my dad? Because I want to know what to do and I want to ask you. But the rest of it, not the rest of it, but so much of it is just noise, angry noise, frustrated noise. And I don't know. I don't know what to believe. Like I said, I'm going to err on the side of caution. I'm going to wear my mask if that protects other people. You know, I haven't, I haven't been quarantined for 14 days since the last time I've been with another person or gone 
to the store. You know, I take care of my dad. We went to the hospital. Actually, we went to the hospital. He had a, just an appointment, but I actually stayed in the car um, because he was fine to go. And I'm like, one less person in the hospital, the better for everybody. Even if I've just taken up a seat in the waiting room, I, I don't need to be there. If I did need to be there, I would have gone in, obviously. But, um, you know, knowing that I'm not completely, I can't tell you if I have COVID or not, apparently, if what we are told is true, which I believe it is, I could have it for two to 14 days without seeing symptoms. Yeah, so, and, I, and I believe all of that. It's just, it's just yeah. when the numbers and the data gets all messed up and corrupt, I'm like, yeah. what are you guys doing? And I think it's sad. I'm just going to say, I don't want to get into too much, but like it's 2020 and all we have to choose from is Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And I'm just going, oh my God, yeah. this is what, this is all I we would got. Really like, I would really, really like to just have something go viral and to say, I would like to run for president. You should run I for would president. Like, yeah, no, I would, I, I, I would not run as a third party, if Joe Biden would step down to allow me to be the candidate, I would do that. Or if we used to, back in the day, probably before you were born, the um, candidates for the political parties were actually chosen at their respective conventions. Everyone would go there and people would, you know, say our delegates from our state give this person this many and this person this many and the first person to get to the winning number was the candidate. So I'm putting myself in the running. I am making, I am giving you the exclusive. I'm declaring that I am running for president right now. It would just be. I'm writing I mean, you it in. Is, yeah, it's gonna it write is you difficult. In. It is. And in no way, wait, let me be clear. In no way am I saying that uh, Donald Trump and Joe Biden are the same. Uh, Donald Trump is a despicable embarrassment. Joe Biden has a long service of history. No, a long history of service. And, um, but just the fact that he's some old white guy that people are seeing as that, just the fact that there's rhetoric around everyone, the fact that people won't like that he was vice president to that black president, you know, all this stupid fucking shit that comes along with everything that I'll be like, you know what, 90s kids, here's what I want. I want to give the world correct information. I want to make everyone as safe as possible. I want everyone to have health care. I want everyone's vote to matter. And the rest you figure out with a very smart group of handpicked people. And so I am declaring that I am running for president of the United States. Yay. I'm so excited. You got my vote, girl. Thank you. You know, before we, we get off here, I have to say, <laughs> this is one of my favorite stories. When I, when you and I first connected, I tried calling you and you, <laughs> <laughs> you did not answer your phone. Tell everyone why you didn't answer because of some random fucking number that said Branson, Missouri. I'm like, hello, telemarketer slash bill collector slash scammer. Why don't I never answer this call in my whole life? And then you left the sweetest message and I called you back right away. And I said, what's with your Branson, Missouri number? And you were like, that's where I live. And I said, I'm coming to visit right now. And we're going to see Yakov and all the great shows and all the wonderful <sighs> things here. As soon as possible. I am itching for a road trip. You'll love it. Yeah. No, I know I'll love it. I'm I know saying it in has, general. Yeah. It has, it, as it far did, as being sheltered in place, I'm right. itching for a road trip. Branson used to have this really bad reputation about being hillbilly and all that. And I'm, I mean, it, it did a little bit. But now it's changed so much that I think... You know, because you've watched The Simpsons. You're a huge fan of The Simpsons, aren't you? Yeah, it's like Las Vegas if it was owned by Ned Flanders. Absolutely. And it is still like yeah. that. I mean, it is family friendly. And I honestly, 
can say that I wouldn't choose to raise my family anywhere else because it really is a great area. But it has, it has changed, though. It's not the hillbilly thing anymore. We've got some great shows mm-hmm. here. We've got um, actually amazing shows, uh, great theme parks, aquariums. we got a new Wonderworks coming in, just all, the, all this fun stuff that you just can't do anywhere else. And so yeah. it's, it's a lot of fun. So I can't wait for you to come here, and I'll take you to some great Korean food as well. I want to come today. Get in the car. Come on over. I will. When I come visit you, I will be coming in my car. I will definitely drive to You Missouri. can stay here. We got a hole downstairs. And if we need to, like, make it all coronavirus ready, we'll do it. But Oh, wait. Is Missouri, is Missouri like swampland? How humid is it for you during the summer? It is pretty humid right now. It's starting to get humid. But yeah. Yeah. I'd fight through that. Heck, yeah. You'd be good. I start out sweaty. So from there, it's like, who else cares? Let it flow. Same. Ladies and gentlemen, Lori Beth Denberg. Thank you for entertaining us through the years and continuing to entertain us. We need we need you right now more than ever. Help us get through all of this and just bring joy. And I just, I just think the world of you. And thank you so much thank for being you. a guest on the show. Thank you for having me. And I, I'm trying to think of what I can do to, to brighten people's lives. And so if this helps, if this helps even one person smile, I'm very happy. You're doing a hell of a job. And, and Lori Beth, where can we find you on social media? You can find me at um, LB Denberg on Instagram. I have a Facebook fan page. Uh, Lori Beth Denberg fan page and I am at Lori Beth Denberg on Twitter where I never tweet because I always forget. I've been trying to be better about using Instagram. So when this drops, as the kids say, I will put it on Instagram with the link and I'll say swipe up so you can see the link. I've learned. I've learned. I don't even know if I know how to do that. I'll show you when I get to Branson. I'll show you. Yes. Awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, one more time, Lori Beth Denberg. You guys are watching the Chris Canote show. I really hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Like, honestly, this was one of the episodes I was so, so excited about. And we got to do it twice. So thank you again. Guys, thanks for watching. Hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button. And we'll see you guys next time on the Chris Canote show. 